Welcome back. In the previous session, we were talking about the politics of the 1920s, and uh, what I need you to know about that is, in a lot of ways, we see um, America moving back to that pre-progressive uh, era kind of mentality, especially when it comes to America's political orientation. Today, what we're going to be doing is discussing the cultural side of these issues, okay? Now, I said this in the last session, and I'm going to reiterate it here again. One of the things that's very important about American life and American culture in the 1920s is we become more American. What do I mean? Well, in a lot of ways, we become more American because we, we have less immigration. We don't have as many people coming from as many diverse places in the 1920s as we had uh, in the time periods before that, uh, that time. But the other thing that I really want to press upon you, and this is going to be paramount for this discussion, is you're seeing the emergence of a truly national American mass culture. Okay, Mass culture, culture for the masses, something that you do in the South that you could take it to the West Coast, and a place that you've never been before, and they would instantaneously know what you're talking about. They had that experience there also. Uh, the same thing as the Northeast, or the Midwest, or the Plain States, or the Southwest, or anything, right? Probably about the best example that I could give you uh, when it comes to a mass culture in this day and age would be McDonald's, right? Um, we've got McDonald's in virtually every corner of the country, now more or less the world. Um, although it, it varies somewhat state by state, uh, maybe the things that you're getting in a Happy Meal in the South, you're not getting in the Northeast or something to that end, but for the most part, it's, it's, it's exactly the same. It's recognizable across boundaries, okay? So that's what I mean by mass culture. Now, at the center of this mass culture in the 1920s was consumerism. And again, we touched upon this the last time we met, and I was talking to you about how by 1920, we were no longer a, cons uh, a producer economy, we were now a consumer economy. The economy functioned as long as American consumers, people like me and you, we went out and we bought stuff, okay? Now, the fact of the matter is, corporate America made sure that we had all kinds of new and cool things to spend our money on in the 1920s. We're talking about things like labor-saving devices. Uh, you now had oil furnaces that could heat entire rooms, and it made the quality of American life infinitely better because you didn't have to go out and you didn't have to chop wood anymore. You had toaster ovens. You had washing machines. I mean, think about how much work it would have done, been to go out and take a load of laundry out to uh, the wash tub with you and, and, and grind it back and forth. Um, you, you've heard of the expression washboard abs. Um, they should probably have called it washboard forearms, considering it would have made your forearms huge uh, having to do that all the time. But at any rate, um, the biggest consumer item, really there are two, but let, let's start out with the radio the first, okay? Radio was a game changer when it comes to American economics, but more importantly, American uh, culture, okay? Now, radio was essentially an invention of the war. It uh, traces its roots back to radar. You send a signal out there, and uh, the time it takes to bounce back to you is um, the, 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 how far your enemy is away from you. Well, over the course of time, it was adapted to fit the needs of a consumer economy, and instead of just sending waves, they sent uh, audio uh, um, uh, messages with them, and they were sent not to bounce off of something, but sent to a receiver. And what you've got is the emergence of what you and I would recognize as modern radio. Now, radio was used for a lot of different things. Some of them are be, would be very recognizable to me or you, and some of them would be a little antiquated. Uh, for instance, um, you're not really going to recognize this unless you've got something like a satellite radio. Uh, maybe there's a few stations like that on uh, satellite radio. But uh, you would have dramas like soap operas, things that you probably would recognize in this day and age. I know Guiding Light uh, uh, emerges around about this time, and it's a soap opera. It's a, it's, it's a drama that plays itself out over several episodes. And so, you know, the, the, the point of a soap opera or a good drama, um, something along the lines of uh, Breaking Bad or The Sopranos or... Um, 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 you know, even comedies like Seinfeld. I know that's uh, dated a little bit, but you get the point that I'm trying to make. The point is, you're going to tune in next week. You're going to tune in next time. And the reason they want you to tune in 
is so that you'll watch their advertisements, okay? Um, radios were generally used to reach new consumers, and you would have corporations, including Ford, had, uh, Ford had the Sunday, uh, the Ford Sunday Hour, where they sponsored classical radio uh, programming, dramas, but they also had bits and pieces where they would familiarize the American public with their products. Uh, General Electric is another good example of a corporation that used radio to reach out into American life and find new consumers. Okay. The other massive innovation when it comes to the American economy would be the automobile. Now, the car does for the American economy what the train had done a generation earlier. If you recall, I was telling you the epicenter of American industry uh, in, the, um, in the Gilded Age would be the railroad because in order to build a railroad you needed steel, you needed coal, you needed oil, you needed timber, you needed finance, you needed people, you needed all of these interrelated industries and it made every aspect of the American economy boom. The car did the exact same thing in the early 20th century and especially by the 1920s when cars became affordable to the masses, mostly thanks to people like Henry Ford. Okay, And so in order to build a, uh, a car, of course you needed steel, you needed rubber, you needed glass, uh, various electrical um, uh, uh, products were also required. But think about what you need to drive a car. You need concrete. And so the construction industry takes off. Uh, the finance industry takes off, considering most people couldn't just go and pay for a car out of pocket. And so for the first time in American history, what you get is credit, okay? The idea of buying now and paying later. Now in the 20s, what they would call this would be the installment plan. You would make installment payments on your Ford Model T, and this would spread out the cost over time, and it would allow more consumers to purchase more things. So the car and the radio are probably the two biggest consumer items that are really driving, no pun intended, and driving the American economy in the 1920s. Okay? And as I've already mentioned, they have a direct impact on how American culture is changing. Okay? Now, if a consumer economy is going to work, you need to continuously make new consumers. Okay? You need to convince people that they need your stuff. Not just watch your stuff, they need it. Okay? I venture to guess that many of you, I certainly am guilty of this, have been the victim of an advertising campaign, okay? Everything from breakfast cereal to underarm deodorant to shampoo to the kind of cars that you drive to the kind of clothes that you wear, uh, you see advertising campaigns aimed at you. I mean, think about what we're going through right now with privacy and the internet, how these corporations want to you know, intersect with companies like Google to network with them so that they are better able to know what you're interested in so that they can sell you these things. Well, that really traces its roots back to the 1920s. And the advertising industry, Madison Avenue in New York was sort of like the center of the advertising industry, it really begins to take off during this period because we now have emerged into a consumer economy. So I'm going to give you a couple quick examples of how corporations basically produce new consumers. The Scott's Paper Company, okay, still around today. Uh, it makes things like paper towels, tissues, um, it makes toilet paper. And in the 1920s, the Scott's um, uh, brand, as a matter of fact, I asked you to read about this uh, advertising campaign this week in your uh, big blue book. Um, the Scott's Paper Company warned consumers that even a slight uh, exposure to an inferior quality paper product could lead to very difficult and a very painful infection. And so what it's saying is, yeah, you could probably get our competitors' uh, toilet paper for a little bit less, but understand, you're going to pay for it in the long run. Okay? Probably a better and certainly more humorous example uh, of an advertising campaign in the 20s would be the famous Listerine ad. I also believe that's in there in your big blue book for this week. But anyway, um, Listerine, the mouthwash company, looked into a case of uh, a lady by the name of Edna. Okay? Now, Edna was 29 years old, and if you're 29 and female in the 1920s and somebody hadn't taken you off the market, somebody hadn't married you yet, there was something clearly wrong with you. Now, for the life of them, Listerine could not figure this one out, considering Edna was pretty enough and she was smart enough and she was, you know, charismatic, and they just couldn't figure out why nobody had uh, tried to marry her. And keep in mind, this is a mouthwash company, they, they narrowed it down to one problem. 
yeah, bad breath. And they said, the line in the advertisement would go, not even your best friend is going to tell you that you've got bad breath because it's so embarrassing, okay? And so in the 1920s, we see the emergence of the advertising industry, but more importantly, I need you to know that things like Scott's Paper and uh, Listerine and uh, they try to think of another household name, Kodak Film, they were sold in every corner of the country. And what that meant was Southerners and Northerners and West Coast people and East Coast people and Plain States people and Southwestern people, they all had the experience of buying these products, at shopping at these uh, uh, maybe department stores, but uh, the, the early grocery stores, uh, things that you and I would recognize today, uh, whereas you don't really have to live in the South to know what it's like to stroll through a Target or a Walmart or a Kroger. Okay. So it's the blending of cultures. That's what I really need you to understand. Now there are other things aside from radios, uh, advertising campaigns that serve to blend culture. And um, one of the things that I need you to be mindful of would be um, music. Now, music has been with us for a long, long time, and of course, when it comes to radio, music was broadcasted over this radio. And at first, as you might imagine, radio stations would pander, would cater to specific demographics. So, for instance, in a place like New York City with a heavy Italian uh, population, there would be an Italian music hour, and of course it would be advantageous for radio stations to sponsor that, considering you know, you'd know you have a lot of listeners. But over the course of time, what you saw happen were various forms of musical expression that begin to go mainstream. Uh, let me give you a quick, for instance, jazz. Right now, obviously jazz was not mainstream before the 1920s. It was a musical expression that was home to the black community. Um, what happens after the 1920s, well, during the 1920s, is jazz music begins to be broadcast over some of these high wattage radio stations, and so more and more people that really, well, they weren't African American, they hadn't really been exposed to African American culture, they're now consuming African American culture. You can make the same case for various other forms of uh, musical expression and otherwise. So you can see that you're getting a bit of a blending of cultures. Movies did the same thing. Okay, now movies were a relatively new technology, film is what I'm talking about. And just like today, what film stars did is they reinforced fads, um, sort of um, popular culture, uh, trends, fashion trends or otherwise, and all over the country you had the same people that are aspiring to be the same uh, kind of movie stars. Now, the movie star of the 1920s, that would be a lady by the name of Clara Bow, B-O-W Bow. Clara Bow was the quote-unquote it girl of the 1920s. Um, it, whether you're talking about uh, maybe somebody like Madonna in the 1990s or Beyonce in the uh, early 20th century, or excuse me, 21st century, um, ladies wanted to be the it girl and men wanted to be with the it girl. Clara Bow began to appear in really famous movies. Her famous movie was just entitled It. And um, it was the first movie when it was released in the late 1920s to gross over a million dollars. It was a huge, huge success. It was a blockbuster. And what people saw on the silver screen when they would go to these movie palaces to watch films like It would be Clara Bow with her shorter skirt, uh, which became a huge trend in the 1920s, her bob haircut. Uh, ladies began cutting their hair much shorter in the 20s than uh, heretofore. Uh, her beret. Various fashion uh, and, and various fashion producers, sort of like uh, Coco Chanel, that uh, becomes a household name in the 1920s. So Clara Bow was a trendsetter in the sense that when people in the South went to go see the movie It, um, when they came back, they began to dress like Clara Bow. Uh, they began to um, uh, do, do some of the same things that uh, she would do. And this wasn't exclusive to the South. You could see it all across the United States. Sports really become mainstream in the 1920s. Now you look at a sport like baseball, and it had been around a lot earlier than the 1920s, much, much earlier than the 20s. Um, but you never had really that superstar. I mean, I guess you could make a case for somebody like Ty Cobb, but he certainly didn't compare to a guy by the name of Babe Ruth. Okay? 
1918, Babe Ruth played for the um, uh, Boston Red Sox. And over the course of time, he was sold to the New York Yankees. And what Ruth did, in, in a very short order, is, is really put baseball on the map culturally. Um, New York had a massive population of immigrants. I mean, people from all across the world lived there. And so you look at an American sport like baseball, and you would have people from the Jewish districts, from the Russian districts, from the um, uh, Italian districts, people that did not know the first thing about baseball that would come down to see Babe Ruth. Why? He wasn't the most technically sound baseball player that has ever played the game. What was different about Babe Ruth really had nothing to do with baseball generally. It was his personality. He had like the Santa Claus personality uh, where he would promise um, orphans that he would hit them a home run or uh, one of my favorite things. In between innings he used to eat like three or four hot dogs and he'd go right back out there and play right field. And, and, and people loved him for it. He had this insatiable appetite uh, for food, for, for, for things like beer, uh, which was illegal at the time in the 1920s. Uh, for, for women, and if you think about Babe Ruth and his personality, it dovetails very, very nicely with the culture of the 1920s and consumerism, generally speaking. Okay? Make the same case for Jack Dempsey, who was a very famous boxer. Um, he had this, uh, this, this saloon, speakeasy if you will, because alcohol is illegal in the 20s, in New York, and it was the place to see and be seen. And uh, for those of you that uh, know a thing or two about American boxing, you know that Jack Dempsey was not the most technically sound fighter. He was not the most sophisticated fighter. But uh, people loved him for the same reasons that they loved Babe Ruth. He was a trendsetter. People liked him. People wanted to be around him. He was very charismatic. Okay. So between things like radio, film, um, music, sports, uh, you are seeing the emergence of a mass culture, a popular culture that can be recognizable across the country. Now, I mentioned this just a minute ago in passing. Um, prohibition. In 1918, Congress passes something called the Volstead Act. Now, this was a long time in coming. Um, uh, temperance, uh, a movement to, to ban alcohol, had, had been in the works for a long, long time. It's not, it's, it's not like in the early part of the 20th century this really picks up steam. Um, the people that want alcohol banned claim that they want it banned for moral purposes, that if you banned alcohol, you would drive down domestic abuse, you would drive down prostitution, you would drive down gambling and other forms of vice. In other words, you could eliminate or at least address a lot of these social ills by taking away the bottle. Well, think about it. I mean, it's quite ironic in a, in a, in a country and a time period, the 1920s, that's becoming ever so concerned about big government oversight, about freedom in American life, and don't have the government tell me how I can and can't live my life, it's ironic that in, in this time period you see prohibition come out, okay? So it, it, it really begs that question, are we freer as the 20th century unfolds? In ways, yes, and in, in, in ways like prohibition, no. Um, was prohibition very successful? If you've ever watched a gangster film, especially one from the 1930s, um, you'll know that it was not very, not very successful. As a matter of fact, the drinking rates went up after the government made the sale and consumption of alcoholic beverages illegal. And it also gave rise to organized crime. Um, if you're, well, a niche for organized criminals. If you're following along with me in the Roaring Twenties uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation, uh, take a look at the guy at the bottom of the screen there, uh, with that slide entitled Prohibition. That would be Al Capone, who pretty much established himself an empire uh, because the government had uh, made alcohol a black market commodity, and he couldn't just go into any store, any corner store, and get it, and it, and it really gave people like Capone a niche in the market. The other thing I'd like you to understand about Prohibition is that it's far more than this moral crusade. Um, think about what demographics of Americans alcohol is really important to. It's not your white Anglo-Saxon native-born Protestants. It, it's typically um, immigrants and second, third generation immigrants. It's Jews, it's Catholics that have a completely different 
idea as to what alcohol is all about and you know what purpose it serves in American life or life generally speaking. So the people that are pushing for prohibition, the illegalization of alcohol, those generally tend to be native-born Protestant Americans. Why? Well, take a look around you. What you see is this flood of immigrants in the time period right before the 1920s, and there's a lot of people that uh, are beginning to worry that American values, traditional American values, are being eroded by all these foreigners. So you pass a law like the Volstead Act that legalizes alcohol, and there are a lot of people that said what that's going to do is, is protect American traditional values. Okay. Now, something else I'd like to mention before we move further. Uh, women. Um, we're, we're beginning to see more and more women enter into the workforce. And uh, you take that and you combine it with the uh, 19th Amendment that gave ladies the right to vote. And, and, and you're really talking about a new era uh, of, 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 of women participating in mainstream American life. Now, the stereotypical understanding of women in the 1920s would be the, uh, the flapper, uh, the lady sort of like uh, Clara Bow that uh, wore her hair short, had a shorter skirt, uh, danced in public, danced with men in public, smoked in public, drank alcohol at a speakeasy in public. Um, that, that, that would be somebody uh, that would be in the acute minority of American women. In other words, American flappers were, were a relative minority in the grand scheme of things, but um, you, you are talking about a completely different vision of women. Um, you're beginning to see the emergence of what historians call the new woman, which is a lot like the new Negro that we were talking about in the aftermath of World War I. It was a far more assertive lady that uh, assumed a much more public role in American life. And it's not just about, you know, it's not just about voting and participating in the democratic process, it's also about things like, you know, participating in mainstream American life, whether, whether that is consuming alcohol or whether it's simply, um, you know, going out in public much, much more often, being seen in public, being heard in public much more often. Now, as I mentioned, there are a lot more women that are in the paid workforce by the 1920s, and just like today, they are paid less um, for men for doing this exact same job. So in 1923, Congress is on the cusp of introducing this new law that would have said, it would have written down in the Constitution that men and women are equal in the eyes of the law. Very similar to the 14th Amendment that says everybody, if you're a natural um, born or naturalized uh, uh, citizen of the United States, you have equal protection uh, under the law. Um, regardless of race, the Equal Rights Amendment, the ERA, would have made that the case for um, gender. In other words, men and women are equal and have equal protection under the law. Now, the ERA is really pretty politically tame. I don't think that there's many of you out there that would say we absolutely cannot have a law that makes woman man's equal. Well, there's a lot of people that had a problem with that in the 1920s, but not the people that you may think. Not necessarily men, although I'm sure there was a few chauvinists that did not want this to be the case. It was progressive women. It was people like Jane Addams that had fought so hard to have these progressive era laws on the books that would protect women. Uh, if you remember the Mueller versus Oregon that said um, that Supreme Court case decision that said you could only legally work a woman for 10 hours per day, that was specifically designed to protect women. So the thought was, if you make women exactly equal to men in American life, what you're going to do is you're going to throw out the baby with the bathwater, right? You're going to throw out all those laws that were specifically designed to protect women. Okay, so it's ironic that one of the biggest groups of Americans that are responsible for defeating the Equal Rights Amendment, and it's not passed, it's not going to be until the 1970s that we talk about ERA again, um, those just so happen to be women. Okay. Now, speaking of culture, we're seeing a very unique culture emerge in these, what I call, black metropolises. Uh, the south side of Chicago would be one, Detroit would be another example of a black metropolis. Uh, a city that saw its black population explode in the aftermath and during the Great Migration of African Americans. But the epicenter of African American cultural life and the biggest black metropolis of all would be New York City. 
The black district of New York City would be Harlem. Okay? And so if you're an African-American um, artist, if you're an African-American writer, uh, somebody like Richard Wright, uh, I, I, I imagine many of you have read some of Richard Wright's works, including Black Boy. If you are an African-American um, political thinker, if you are an African-American poet, uh, an African-American musician, somebody like, uh, um, somebody like uh, uh, Louis Armstrong, Harlem was the place to be. Right? I mean, that's where not only everybody else like you went, all these cultural expressionists, all these artists uh, and writers, but it, 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 was, it was the place to be seen as well. Let me give you a couple quick examples. Now, we know that the NAACP uh, had based its um, organization in Harlem, New York, and one of the individuals that's really going to take the torch from Webb Du Bois and uh, uh, lead it not only in another direction, but um, uh, in a quite different direction, that would be a Jamaican-born immigrant by the name of Marcus Garvey. Now, Marcus Garvey was drawn to Harlem for many of the reasons that I had just outlined. That was the place to be for African-American intellectuals like Garvey. But Garvey had started this organization that he called the Universal Negro Improvement Association. Now, there are a few different points that I'd like you to be mindful of for, the, uh, Mar for Marcus Garvey and the um, UNIA. Um, but the most important point that I need you to be mindful of, black separatism. Keep in mind, Webb Du Bois, back in the Progressive Era, said, you're never going to get a fair shake from white America. So why are you begging for integration? What we need is black-owned banks and black-owned schools and black-owned hospitals for the black community. Marcus Garvey is, is really the new advocate. He's picking up where Webb Du Bois kind of left off for black separation. And one of the points of his Universal Negro Improvement Association was, let's just give white power to America. Let, let's cede power in the United States to white America. But in return for that, what we want is black power in Africa. Right? We want decolonization. As a matter of fact, one of the things that he wanted to see happen was uh, carving out colonies in Africa uh, to, to, to move away, to literally separate from white America. So you've got Marcus Garvey and his Universal Negro Improvement Association that uh, is very much part of the Harlem Renaissance. Now think about the word Renaissance, right? Rebirth. Um, I always like to think about it, and I say this in 1301, is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, right? Leonardo, Raphael, Michelangelo, Donatello, right? Those, those great artists. So in the context of European history, you're talking about the rebirth of art, right? In the case of the Harlem Renaissance, you're talking about the rebirth or birthing, I guess you could say, of modern African-American culture, okay? And certainly, Marcus Garvey would be a part of this uh, political science uh, movement that's, that's really emerging in Harlem. But what I need you to understand here is the Harlem Renaissance, and I want you to write this down, the Harlem Renaissance seeks to use the arts, whether that be political science, whether it be poetry, whether it be literature, music, um, what have you, to promote civil rights. The use of, uh, of culture, the use of high culture, to promote civil rights in American life. Okay? And so you've got a poet like Langston Hughes, very, very famous poet like Langston Hughes, uh, that wrote a lot of poetry in the 1920s, but one of his more famous piece, pieces was The Negro Speaks of Rivers. And in that piece, he mentions three rivers. He talks about the Euphrates, he talks about the Nile, and he talks about the Mississippi. And what he, he does in this piece is he kind of connects the African, the pan-African experience all across the globe, the Euphrates being in the Middle East, uh, the Nile being in Africa, and of course the Mississippi being in North America. And if you think about it, and you go ahead and read or have heard his poem, um, it, it connects this pan-African, this idea that Africans have been um, scattered across the globe uh, throughout human history. Um, it's talking about the African experience um, uh, throughout, throughout that context. Uh, Duke Ellington and Ella Fitzgerald, um, some of the greatest jazz musicians of all time, and they were based right there in Harlem. And 
jazz was certainly something that was used as a way to promote civil rights. It was talking about it. It was, it was, um, it was articulating on the black experience in the United States. If you think about it, music, art, sports, baseball looks an awful lot like rounders and uh, cricket in, in sports that were played in Great Britain. There, there's not too many cultural things that can really be said to be forged on the North American continent and really be fundamentally American. Jazz would certainly be an exception to that. Uh, born and bred in places like New Orleans, jazz accompanied African Americans up to the North as they participated in the Great Migration. They brought it to places like Chicago, uh, they brought it to places like New York, and of course they brought it to places like, um, like um, Harlem. Now, if you think about one of the most, maybe the most famous jazz club of all time, the Cotton Club in Harlem, you had some of the most famous jazz musicians that would play there. Louis Armstrong played there. The thing about the Cotton Club is it was a Jim Crow club. You had famous, famous very famous African-American musicians playing for exclusively white audiences. The rule of the day was if your skin color was darker than the shade of a brown paper bag, they would not let you inside the Cotton Club. So you've got white audiences that are patronizing black musicians. Now don't get me wrong, this is a good thing in the sense that Langston Hughes is becoming a wealthy man, uh, people like Louis Armstrong becoming very wealthy, but it, it, it's really kind of commercializing, it's kind of corporatizing, I guess you could say, the idea of African American culture. What was once upon a time something used to promote you know, not only the arts, but also things like civil rights, is, is now just being used to make money. Okay, So if you really wanted to see jazz in its purest form, in its most intimate of settings, you didn't go to the Cotton Club. I mean, it's, the civil, it's a similar situation that we have right now. If you're, if you're playing someplace like Madison Square Garden or um, clo um, you know, someplace like uh, the American Airlines Center in Dallas, um, you know you've made it, right? If you're a band and, and you're playing in those locations, those venues, you've certainly made it, right? If you want to see, you know, a, a, an up-and-coming band, one that's really hungry, one that's really good, trying to make it, you don't go to those places. You go to these hole-in-the-wall little bars, little pubs, and you see people that are up and coming. Well, if you want to see a jazz musician or band like that, you, you would go to a place called the Speakeasy. Now, we know what speakeasies are. They were illegal bars because alcohol, the consumption of alcohol, had been made illegal in the 1920s. A speakeasy was a place that you could speak easy. You could have a drink, you could have a beer, not worry about, uh, you know, getting arrested for doing that. Now, just like almost everything else in American life in the 1920s, there were places that African Americans couldn't go, and there were a lot of white speakeasies that said, look, your money's no good here at our establishment. We don't want blacks in our speakeasies. No, this is very bad, don't get me wrong, but it also created a market niche for African American entrepreneurs, and some of these black entrepreneurs are not only serving alcohol in black speakeasies, they're also inviting black jazz musicians in, up-and-coming musicians in, to play for them as live entertainment. And so if you're a, a hipster white kid, right, somebody from the suburbs, you know, and you really wanted to, 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 to really be cool, you, you didn't go to the Cotton Club to see a show, you went to one of these black speakeasies. As a matter of fact, the black speakeasy was one of the, you know, bedrock institutions when it comes to the intermixing of the races. You didn't see that in, in everyday American life. And it was one of the only places in American life where you had blacks and whites um, of different genders, I might add, uh, intermixing with one another. Now the other thing, the other place that you could go, um, predominantly if you were African American, uh, if you wanted to see, you know, a hungry jazz musician, in some cases literally, uh, you would go to a quote-unquote rent party. Uh, don't know about you, but when I was in college, uh, every once in a while it was kind of interesting whether or not we were going to make rent. And so, you know, what we would do is we would have parties and, you know, we would rent um, uh, rent like a, a boxing match or a, a mixed martial arts match or something like that. Just invite everybody in and say we're taking quote-unquote donations and that's sometimes 
as, as sad as this might seem, is sometimes how we made rent. It's a similar thing for these rent parties in the African American districts. Uh, they would invite jazz bands or jazz musicians in to play uh, for the community and they would accept donations. And that's how some of these people in some of these apartment complexes or houses in places like Harlem, that's how some of these people would make rent. But that was where you could see jazz in its purest of forms. Okay. So I hope I've really given you some perspective on how American culture is changing and the emergence of what you and I would call uh, a modern culture. As a matter of fact, uh, there's a lot of historians, myself included, that believe that the 1920s um, is the most similar decade, time period, if you will, um, in which you see similarities, direct similarities, to how we live our life today in the 21st century. But, like any time,